Now, I'd like to invite Mr. Tony Sham, Chairman of the um, ICE Distinguished Lectures, to say a few words. Tony, please. Thank you. Um, our guest of honor, Professor Ian Holiday. Um, Professor Francis Sao, Head of the uh, Civil Engineering Department of University of Hong Kong, um, Professor C.K. Mack, um, Vice President International of ICE, and our keynote speaker this evening, um, Mr. Peter Hansford, uh, past president of um, ICE, um, Professor Ken Ho, chairman of um, ICE Hong Kong Association, um, other distinguished guests, um, fellow ICE members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, as you know, to commemorate the um, 200th anniversary this year of ICE, um, the Hong Kong Association has launched a program of events aimed at infusing the profession, enhancing our public image, and inspiring the next generation. And the program include, in particular, a series of distinguished lectures. The first one, entitled Excellence and Innovation, There's No Bridge Too Far, was delivered by Dr. Robin Sham and Dr. Anna Ruiz Terran on um, the 13th of March. And the second one was held on um, the 30th of August when engineer James Brake shared with us his perspectives on pointers of successful delivery of infrastructure projects based on Hong Kong's success story for her infrastructure development in the past half century. And these two lectures attract nearly 700 participants. And the theme of the third and finale lecture this evening is very much to echo the focus of ICE 200, engineers transform and protect lives. And this time we're delighted to have um, the University of Hong Kong as the co-organizer of our lecture. Our keynote speaker this evening, Professor C.K. Mack, in collaboration with three progressive engineers, will share the local and overseas experience on how they and other civil engineers have contributed to fulfilling this ICE mission. Before we start the lecture, we are very honored this evening to have Professor Ian Holliday here with us as our guest of honor. Professor Holliday is the um, Vice President and Pro Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning of the University of Hong Kong. He assists the Hong Kong U President in setting the direction and policy for the university's curriculum, teaching and learning, and quality assurance of our undergraduate and postgraduate curricula. Previously, he was the Dean of Social Science at University of Hong Kong and the Dean of Humanities and Social Science at City University. And his research work focuses on Myanmar politics and governance. Now, without uh, further ado, let's welcome Professor Holliday on stage to give us uh, the opening <laughs> rebuff. Well, thanks very much, Tony. Um, CK, Ken, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be standing here on behalf of the University of Hong Kong as one of the co-organizers of this grand finale for the ICE's bicentennial uh, year of events here in Hong Kong. Um, as Tony said, I'm a social scientist, so I'm at a distinct disadvantage in giving this speech to a room full of civil and other engineers. Um, I know very little about engineering but I do know something about our engagement with the engineering profession here at Hong Kong U, not over the past 200 years and not over the 200 years to come, but in the last 15 years or so, and in the next, say, five to 10 years, um, we've picked up on one of the, the terms here in, in, in the theme for this evening. There's a lot of P's up there, but the one that I'm interested in is the T, the transform. Um, civil engineers 
uh, protecting and transforming lives. Uh, there's a lot of transformational work going on between ICE and led particularly by CK and many of his colleagues and Hong Kong U. Fifteen years ago, um, we, we were part of an initiative called Project Mingda in mainland China, uh, which is involved initially in building schools in rural Guangxi, uh, moved on to clinics and community facilities and bridges. And we are still engaged with that program. We now have Li Hai San Foundation uh, funding for the program. And what it enables us to do is not only transform lives for villages in rural China, but also to transform the lives of our own student engineers. They go not once, not twice, but probably six, eight, ten times to engage in a project from the initial needs assessment and, and, and scoping out the project all the way through construction. And in the process, they themselves have an educational experience that we couldn't possibly give them here at Hong Kong U, that we probably couldn't possibly give them here in Hong Kong, but that we can give them in mainland China. And that has been just a fabulous collaboration between the university and the institute that we really, really value. What we've done with Lehigh San Foundation funding is the one condition that they gave us for, for donating money to the university was that we take that from a, an engineering program to a full campus program. We have 10 faculties at Hong Kong U. They range from arts, science, social science, non-professional faculties, through professional faculties like dentistry, medicine, law. And the challenge was involve students from every single one of those 10 faculties. So our five-year horizon with Lehigh San Foundation and working with the Institute and working with engineers is to turn this into a, an interdisciplinary program that can enable students to have those transformative moments, those, those learning opportunities, not just by crossing a physical frontier, but also by crossing disciplinary and intellectual frontiers. And that has been a really exciting program. CK and I went to Myanmar a few, week, a few months ago, in fact, in August, and we hosted a delegation from Myanmar so that we can also take the, the Mingda concept to Myanmar where just as in rural China, they, they deeply need some engagement from the outside world. They have all sorts of challenges. And so this is a really exciting agenda for us. So th there's not much I can say, as I said, as a social scientist about the themes that have driven the Institute for the past 200 years and that will drive it for the next 200 years. But we do have a window on the work of the ICE. And for us at Hong Kong U, it's been absolutely fabulous. So I said at the beginning, it's a real privilege and an honor for Hong Kong used to be part of this. And it is not just because we're associated with the bicentenary, but because we're also associated with the work of the ICE and working with the educational mission of the ICE. And that for us is absolutely central to our own uh, aims and objectives and, and mission as, a, as an institution here in Hong Kong with of course a wider regional remit. So thank you very much CK and colleagues for bringing this here um, and have a great lecture this evening and a great uh, end and, and finale to the whole year of bicentennial events. Thank you very much. Professor Holiday, please uh, remain on stage. We have something for you. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Ken Ho, Chairman of the ICE Hong Kong Association, to present a little souvenir. A guest of honor. Ken, please. Thank you, Professor Holiday, and thank you, Ken. I would like to now invite Tony to join the stage again to introduce the speakers of the evening. Tony, please. Thank you, Professor Holiday, for your opening remark. Thank you. What well, is um, exceptional this evening that we have four speakers to deliver the distinguished lecture to be led by uh, Professor C.K. Mack. And this is, of course, by design and not by chance. Um, we'll shortly hear the sharing on how they and other civil engineers have contributed to fulfilling the IC mission. Engineers protect and transform lives. And in highlighting the three Ps of professionalism, passion, and preparedness. Professor C.K. Mack was a career civil servant he joined the Hong Kong government after, after graduating from the Hong Kong U in civil engineering. And during his first seven years of civil service, he served in various senior positions, 
in government, including um, the head of the Railway Development Office, project manager, director of highways, and permanent secretary for development in charge of government's work policies and public works program. Before retirement, he took up the unique appointment as the team leader to oversee the Hong Kong SAR government-funded reconstruction works in, in Sichuan, China, after the May 12 devastating earthquake in year 2008. He, li he liaised with the mainland officials to devise a Hong Kong 9 billion reconstruction program comprising 150 projects for schools, hospitals, and roads, etc. And the reconstruction program was successfully completed in 2015. In addition to his public service, he has been teaching in various universities in Hong Kong, including here in Hong Kong U, for over 30 years. You couldn't believe that. His passion is to build and strengthen the bonds between students, young engineers, and more experienced seniors through teaching and interaction and experimental learning ventures. And as our members know, CK is currently ICE's Vice President International. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the next speakers on stage, Professor C.K. Mack and his team of uh, co-speakers, Ms. Florence Go, Ms. Angel Ho, and Mr. Max Ng. <laughs> and C.K., C.K., may I defer to you to introduce to the audience your team members, please? The stage is all yours, C.K. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Can you hear me at the back? OK, yeah. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, distinct, it's a distinct honor for me to be invited to uh, speak at the finale uh, event of ICE 200. Uh, I don't know, you know, we are still in the finale year, in, in, in this uh, year of celebration. And uh, even though we are moving to the, to the end of the, of the year, and uh, this is a particular occasion, and we like to make use of this uh, particular lecture to rehearse on this uh, ICE's uh, mission for the uh, bicentenary. The 200 years of uh, ICE's history already demonstrated that civil engineers protect and transform lives. Uh, we civil engineers all know about this. We do not need to convince ourselves. I think politicians, government officials, and uh, even the media know about uh, the good things that uh, engineers would, would, uh, would bring. However, there are sectors in the uh, society who do not know what engineers actually had contributed. So our focus is to tell the general public. We want them to know that engineers, they are the unsung heroes, they are the invisible people who actually had brought them a lot of uh, benefits. At the same time, we also like to inspire our younger generation to join the profession, making clear that this is a creative, is an interesting, and also with a lot of fun, this career. So uh, the ICE mission actually inspired me to invite more people to join hand. Uh, I think it would be really dull. After two minutes or 10 minutes, you will fall asleep if I speak for two hours. <laughs> so uh, I have invited three young, progressive engineers to join me. And I think together we can project, we can present a more comprehensive uh, perspective of ICE missions. So they are Florence, Angel, and Max. Florence, <laughs> Florence is a civil engineer with uh, experts in uh, geotechnical engineering. She spent a lot of time in the geotechnical office in uh, government and responsible for formulating planning, uh, private and public uh, slopes, uh, controls. And uh, uh, 
she actually uh, was posed to the trees uh, office. She's now the heading the, the office, and you will know very soon that trees are very important, and I think you will agree. Uh, she has a lot of degrees, uh, which I don't want to talk about. Uh, it's a long list, but uh, she is graduated from uh, UST, and she has law degrees. She has, uh, 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 what's that, uh, <laughs> geotechnical. <laughs> she has uh, soil mechanics. Uh, oh, uh, too many that I, I do not remember. <laughs> Uh, let me see, uh, a law degree from the University of London, a master's degree in arbitration and dispute resolution from the uh, Chinese University, soil mechanics and environmental geotechnics uh, from the Imperial College of London. So it's impressive. Andrew is a construction uh, engineer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she graduated from uh, this university and after that she, she worked in contractors and uh, during her training years, she actually has a lot of uh, uh, social service and she was a voluntary uh, uh, institution when she actually played a lot of role and visit many places to uh, see uh, the backward countries and the backward regions. That has inspired her to uh, join the Medicine Science Frontier Endurance which means it's uh, Doctors Without Borders. And this is, uh, gave her a unique experience to work in countries like Afghanistan and uh, South Africa, called a place called what do, Sierra Angle. Yeah. And uh, with that, she had a lot of uh, passion in looking at uh, uh, engin what engineers can do to these uh, places. After she returned to Hong Kong, she's now in the uh, Mass Transit Railway Corporation's uh, construction team, the starting to Central Link. <laughs> Max, Max is our youngest team member. Uh, <laughs> she graduated in also from this university, and uh, she had a lot of passion about uh, uh, doing engineering work, of course, and. Uh, he is actually uh, selected by Professor Mayer, the past, uh, the, the outgoing uh, ICE president, as the future leaders. So it's uh, uh, special for her uh, performance and her career. Uh, he actually worked in uh, MTRC, and uh, he's also an engineer in the <laughs> Sorry, I. I'm, I'm not uh, meant to be offensive, but I, I just want to tell you that uh, we have uh, young engineers uh, with us. Uh, I want to tell you that, in fact, just now you know about this. ICE past president, Professor Peter Hansford, is uh, with us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you, Peter, for sparing time to come to us. Uh, Professor Hansford's current uh, assignment in Hong Kong is to do something concerning the starting to central link. But he told me that he won't answer any question tonight, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, Professor Hansford is a uh, famous uh, expert in a lot of the uh, inquiry and review studies. Uh, his uh, latest uh, review report entitled uh, In Plain Work, this one, right, was uh, presented to the ICE Council just last week. I was there, and uh, it gave insightful uh, ideas of how we should look at this. So uh, his opening remark is particularly relevant to, to us tonight. So uh, why don't we have a look of these uh, few statements that uh, Professor Hansford had made. It's eight here. So Sai, can we dim the light a little bit? Yeah. Society rightly expects building infrastructure to be planned, designed, construct, operate, and maintained in such a manner as to present an extremely low risk of failure and to cause negligible hazards to occupants and users and, and so on. All right? No designer wants that uh, to carry out their work with the deliberate intention for, for, for uh, endangering others, isn't it? But that said, we have recently seen catastrophic uh, failures of motorways, of bridges, and uh, Grenfell Tower, 
And in particular, uh, we are now even looking at our own case in Hong Kong. So I think uh, Professor Hansford's uh, work and concern about the engineering profession is really profound. And uh, we are very grateful for uh, Professor Hansford spending time to join us uh, this evening. So if you look at ICE's vision, when we say protect and transform life, we were talking about a sustainable uh, world in the future and how we engineers can do, do all this. And I think it would be useful to go back a little bit to sustainable development. It, takes, uh, it has taken a long, long time. Uh, 1972 was the first United Nations uh, summit or conference, only one Earth. And after another 20 years, in 1992, uh, the UN has another conference on environment and development. It's really the debate between development and conservation. And the Agenda 21 was, uh, the Agenda 21 was published in, in those days, letting people know what exactly was meant by sustainable development. And then, 2002, another 10 years, this World Summit of Sustainable Development, using sustainable development as a title of this uh, summit, have people planet prosperity as a motto. What does that mean? People meaning social acceptance. Planet is environmental conservation. Prosperity, of course, is economic development. And the turn of the century, the UN put forth another eight millennium goals. And quickly, that's covered to all. Uh, 102015, when people know that, we have to go further. And uh, that was transformed into an even bigger uh, scope of uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals. So I think if we look at all this, they are part and partial of the whole concept of how we are going forward into the future. So ICE uh, just uh, had this Global Engineering Congress held in uh, October in London, it was hosted by Institution of Civil Engineer, led by Wilfield, which is the World Federation of Engineering Organization, under the patronage of UNESCO, and in association with all these institutions, American Society, Canadian, European, and the uh, Council of Engineering. That means this whole thing is not just ICE, but it's global. It's everyone. It's engineering profession. Everyone would have a role to play in this particular uh, concept of how we can move ahead to have a sustainable future. So uh, with a brief uh, review on these uh, particular concepts and uh, sustainable things, I think we can move on to our uh, main uh, presentation uh, this evening. Uh, we would like to divide our presentation and civil engineer protect and transform life under six headings. These are six headings. Uh, four of us would uh, present interactively. And uh, this is a first attempt. Uh, we hope it works this way. Uh, you will see we're passing, passing around uh, our, our, our rods and whatever. But I think this is uh, an interesting way of looking at civil engineers protect and transform lives, right? Uh, let's start with something close to us, homes for a million, right? People say Hong Kong's uh, housing program or accommodation or home all start with a fire. And this fire was uh, in 1953, Christmas Day, when this fire at Sakip May ranged for six hours, burned down 7,000 squatter, 53 thousand people homeless overnight. And that triggered the government to go ahead with uh, uh, resettlement program, building uh, resettlement estates. And that has later on transformed into the public housing program in Hong Kong. And we are still doing all this today. And we are still doing about land for housing. So in the particular uh, Ter terrain and hilly terrain in Hong Kong and the uh, limited land area, vertical density 
had actually served Hong Kong well. That's why Hong Kong ranked really well number one in terms of uh, high-rise skyscrapers. But, but what? The post four years in Hong Kong saw rapid urban development. Due to the hilly terrain, land for development was formed by extensive site formation, um, cutting into the hillside and also by failing to form platforms. But with no regula regulatory controls of the site formation works, there were a large number of substandard mammoth slopes close to development. And here is where the landslide problems began. The landslide started from the hill above Po Shan Road. Debris crossed the road and engulfed the garage at number 21. This then slipped down the hillside and toppled over. The landslide gathered momentum and swept away the property at number 11 Coatwall Road before continuing on to Coatwall Court. The force of the debris and landslide brought down the 12-story tower block with the collapsing building hitting the upper part of the newly refurbished block at Greenview Gardens. The scale and speed of the catastrophe shocked everyone. In all, 67 people lost their lives, and two residential buildings and a number of other structures were obliterated. So coupled with the lack of control, there was also a lack of knowledge on slope works and the effect of rainwater. Cut and fill slopes were formed following rule of thumb principles. And as a result, there were frequent landslides in the 60s and the 70s, and some causing multiple fatalities. Hong Kong engineers soon realized that the root causes of the landslide problems in Hong Kong are varied. And these include high seasonal rainfall, and also thick tropical uh, weather ground, and also steep terrain that was cut to very steep angles. And these have posed major challenges. As substandard slopes, they are marginally stable. And any failure will have high consequence in our dense urban setting. So the Geotechnical Engineering Office was set up in 1977 to deal with these challenges following the bitter landslide events in 1972 and 1976. And in the ensuing years, GEO planned and implemented slope safety system to reduce landslide risk. And a major achievement is the Landslip Preventive Measures Program that has retrofitted all substandard mammoth slopes over a 30 years period. And the program was extended to 2010 and was followed by the Landscape Prevention and Mitigation Program that includes Natural Hillside as well. So with these programs in place and successfully implemented, the landslide risk arising from old mammoth slopes has been reduced to less than, uh, to less than 50% of the risk um, that existed in 1977 by 2000. And by year 2010, we further reduced the risk to less than 25% of that in 1977. For natural hillside, we are using different innovative measures to mitigate the increasing landslide risk coming from our natural hillsides as a result of urbanization continues um, to encroach into the um, natural terrain. We have also um, put in a series of risk reduction measures apart from the long-term programs. We publish slope engineering standards and good practice. We contain risk by geotechnical control. We exercise screening criteria for new developments during the uh, planning and land disposal stage. We also enhance aesthetics of upgrade features. 
maintain all government mixed loops. And also we um, undertake safety screening and we require maintenance of all private loops. Reduce risk by uh, post by squatters by clearance. Apart from that, we also invest a tremendous amount in public education, publicity, and also landside emergency service. So when the GEO was set up in 1977, the landslide risk was at record high here. With the dedication of engineer and application of technical skills, Hong Kong has successfully contained landslide risk by containing risk from new developments, reduce risk from existing development, and minimize landslide consequences. Looking ahead, slope degradation and extreme weather will still pose challenges in the upkeeping of all slopes. And modern day technology enhancement has allowed big data analytics to identify patterns and allow us to formulate management strategies. In addition, the use of deep learning in identifying features on natural slopes, Internet of Things for monitoring debris um, resisting barriers, and also through development of landslide modeling using advanced algorithms will increase the efficiency and predictability in slope management in Hong Kong and also elsewhere. Geotechnical and civil engineers indeed have uh, enhanced our life and uh, through their efforts uh, on slope stabilities. And uh, if we look at the hillsides in Hong Kong, everyone would quickly realize that it's really green, very green indeed. And uh, trees, yes, trees. Everywhere are trees. But uh, we know that trees are good. We like to have the shade. But uh, few people realize that trees also cause hazards until really a few cases when trees actually brought harm to the human uh, people. And sadly, in some cases, uh, even uh, lives. In 2009, government actually published a tree policy in Hong Kong. And it says very clearly, people, tree, can, can we have harmony? In the crowded urban cityscape, we can build, can we build an environment where people and trees can coexist in harmony? Benefits of trees are many. According to the Hong Kong 2030 Plus, published by the planning department in 2016, green spaces are and should continue to be lungs of cities. And these lungs play an indispensable role in carbon sequestration, pollution amelioration, noise abatement, and also relieve urban heat island effect, improve microclimate, enhance biodiversity, and provide visual relief. There is actually abundant green space in Hong Kong. Around 78% of Hong Kong's total land is vegetated. And Country Park occupies about 40% of our land. With over 100 meters square vegetation cover per person, Hong Kong ranked third among 22 major Asian cities. In terms of trees, Hong Kong has performed not badly. There are about 2.5 million of urban trees. 2.5 million of urban trees in Hong Kong, let alone those within the country parks. And the ratio of trees to people is comparable to other international cities elsewhere, 
such as Singapore, Paris, and New York. But trees, um, they are not engineered structures. Um, they are living organisms. They grow under stress, they age, and they die. During this natural cycle, trees are bound to cause harm to the public if they fail. And in our dense urban setting, even a minor failure could be harmful, and in a few unfortunate cases, cause even fatality. So if urban trees are not properly managed, they will lead to public safety issues. And in August this year, um, I'm sorry this is in Chinese, but then this is what the local media, um, they report mostly on our tree issues. So um, this is the event that occurred in August this year. A branch failure caused the death of a domestic helper. And in the past 10 years, there were a few fatal incidents. Tree safety has all the time been a hot topic in the media. And this has come to a peak recently when we were hit by the Typhoon Mancut. I have taken this picture from a magazine, a local magazine, to illustrate to you the general public sentiments towards fallen trees brought down by the typhoon. There are more than 60,000 reports of fallen trees. And in light of the large number of fallen trees, the media commented, is this a natural disaster or human fault? Before I give any views on that comment, I would like to share with you some facts. In terms of risk due to individual incidents, the average annual risk of fatality due to fallen trees or branch failure, sorry, or branch failure for individual is in the order of 10 to the power minus 7. And this is well within the as low as reasonably practicable level, I mean set by HSC in the UK. This figure is also well below the upper limit of 10 to the power minus 5 for an off-site individual associated with potentially um, hazardous installation as required by Hong Kong PSG. And to put this in perspective, the average annual risk of Dying in a traffic accident is about 10 to the power minus 4. And for fallen trees during typhoons, if we look at the number of fallen trees in previous typhoons, which, is, which, are, which were less severe, and then the stronger ones recently, that just had to last year, Amon cut this year, it is clear that the number of fallen trees increases exp exponentially as the wind speed increases. And the Beaufort scale, which sets at level 10 winds, houses damaged, houses damaged, and trees blown down. And during typhoon and cut, this level of winds has sustained for 10 hours or more. And these are the facts. Despite the extremely low risk posed by trees, we actually have invested a lot in managing our urban trees. We have a management framework to inspect trees and mitigate their risk. We also preserve our unique stonewall trees and old and valuable trees as far as possible, even though they are structurally marginally stable and old. To some, conservation is not questionable. But to some, more sustainable solution may be to replenish them with new and vibrant trees that keep our cityscape moving with the modern minds and, li and lifestyles. We try our best to bring hopes to the industry. 
We are exploring the use of technology in undertaking inspection, monitoring tree health, and sensing structural stability. As we continuously improve, we want to work smarter with a view to responding to tree hazards more promptly and minimizing risk to the public. As you mentioned, a career in agricultural industry. People who love trees can develop a professional career in this industry. Through comprehensive training, to help them gain experience and expertise. And for people and trees in harmony, we need people's support. And we do hope that by more risk communication, people will appreciate the benefits of trees and provide opportunity for this young industry to grow and become mature. And I believe with the trust that we build between us and the public, we will achieve that goal in the end. Trees survive because of uh, the nutrition from soil and water. Early settlements in uh, Hong Kong Island cannot survive without water. But Hong Kong has no major lake or the river cannot support our uh, residents and our people here. So we rely on the rainwater. So it naturally brings us to uh, talk about water supply and treatment of uh, waste water. Water supply has always been a challenge for Hong Kong and our engineers. To store water in Hong Kong, which is surrounded by undrinkable seawater, with few lakes or rivers, our engineers built the Titan Dam, the world's largest concrete dam in British colonies in 1888. Without the modern technology or plants in everyday sites that we are now enjoying, actually concreting or tunneling can be very challenging and required innovation. This project cost the government's yearly annual revenue which seems far-fetched now. But this project has secured the water supply for 200,000 people for 100 years till today. Now, the 21 declared monument in the panoramic Titan Waterworks Heritage Trail might remind us to pay tribute to those invisible superheroes who have contributed their efforts to bring us the water supply. We have built more and more reservoirs to satisfy the demand of our growing population. The Shingmun Reservoir is another case of the challenges that our engineers have overcome. But when our population surged from 200,000 to millions, water shortage became more and more frequent. In the 70s and 80s, our engineers turned sea into reservoir twice. The Prophet Cove and High Island Reservoirs were examples how our engineers make use of the power of the nature to bring water to the people in Hong Kong. And with the Dongjiang water, which has provided us with 70% of water usage, Hong Kong is now safe with our water supply. The wastewater is another challenge for our engineers to solve, especially in this modern city. In 15 years, our engineers built the world's deepest sewage tunnel, linking all the way from Zhengguan O, Chai Wen, Abli Chow to the sewage treatment works in Stonecutters. It was the, is the world's deepest as far as 168 meters and 44 kilometers long. Each day, the sewage and volume of 1,000 swimming pools from more than 5 million people are transported all the way in this inverted siphon to stonecutters to be centrally treated. This is not an easy project. I believe many of you could share more stories on how the challenges were overcome. But without which, we could not have enjoyed the beautiful harbor and also the 
events that we once had 40 years ago, the annual cross harbor swimming race. This project has won the ICE Edmund Henry Medal this year for its technical excellence. But this was also the first project to be shortlisted as the International Choice for the People's Choice Award. People's Choice Award of the ICE is not chosen only by the engineers, but also by the general public. People's choice are often not the engineer's choice, but they do tell how these projects are the choices of everyone to the sewage question. Rod yields no water, but our engineers have harnessed the power of nature to build them on rock and to convey sewage in rock. The project might take tremendous efforts of one generation, but this has prepared our cities and provided everything that we need for our growth across generations. With uh, <coughs> rapid urbanization, uh, the population in Hong Kong grows with all the economic activities, and we just heard that uh, that had resulted in various demand of land, housing, cutting slopes, water supplies and uh, uh, water treatment. <clears throat> I think we cannot forget how the city has been uh, kept moving because of the demand of uh, people to travel from one place to the, uh, to the other. Keeping Hong Kong moving has been an important government policy in terms of transportation. And uh, with the rise in the uh, living standard, people start to uh, have more automobiles, cars, and whatever. But with a small cities uh, like Hong Kong, I hope it won't be like something like this. This is, an, of course, uh, not in Hong Kong. But this, could it be in Hong Kong or in our Hong Kong neighboring regions? when car ownership and the highways actually had resulted in uh, uh, moving car parks. And uh, even though we have uh, public services like uh, mass transit systems, sometimes uh, the system may still may not cope when festival seasons, when people come, want to get their tickets. Looking at Hong Kong's, we have to understand that the mass transit railway system has served Hong Kong well for almost 40 years. The first MTR, Kun Tong Lan, was opened in 1979. Next year, 2019, it would be the 40th anniversary of this system. People seem to have taken for granted the mass transit railway. And from that onwards, we have the system expanding, growing, and we have more railway lines and networks. We travel on the mass transit every day. We can touch it. We can feel it. We take it for granted that the system should be like that without knowing that for the last 40 years, it ranks well number one with 99.9% .9 punctuality. Of course, people argue. People did not understand the system that they've been using. It's the, it's the work and the contribution of a lot of invisible uh, engineers. Like most underground constructions, we can see one of the railway which uh, we have uh, been trying to, to build it with a lot of uh, difficulties. As we all know, the Admiralty Station is one of the busiest underground train stations in Hong Kong, where many lines meet. In the recent expansion of the Admiralty Integrated Station to include the South Island Line and the Sha Tin to Central Link was by any means a massive challenge. To build four more tunnels and two more platform concourses underneath an existing station.
While the site works were constrained by the external environment and a busy operating railway station, these challenges were overcome by the project team with good planning and technical input. The biggest challenge to the team was the complex underpinning works for the, oper um, for the operating island line railway. It lasted one and a half years from the initial stage of forming a massive supporting beam under the island line base lab to the completion of permanent columns for supporting the island line railway. This enabled the top-down excavation for more than 40 meter depth and 150,000 cubic meters of rock. And the temporary structural steel columns for the underpinning works were installed progressively and then extended incrementally as the excavation continued downwards underneath the existing station. During the underpinning and excavation operations, the island line railway structure was carefully monitored at every stage, involving hundreds of instrumentation and monitoring points, which was monitored by the project team as well as the railway protection teams. The staged underpinning operations with the use of computer controlled hydraulic jack system demanded both resources and time. The challenge to the team from day one was to safely imp implement such a delicate technical system with multi-stage rock excavation and hydraulic jacking all happening below such an important and at the same time operating railway line, which at the same time completing the operation within a very tight time frame. While everyone is using, still using or queuing for the island line or the Chunwan lines, or probably even complaining, <laughs> underneath the project team managed to excavate and build two new lines. The success demonstrated how civil engineers transform our transportation system while still ensuring everyday services, which was also recognized worldwide by the ICE Fresnel Award this year. many aspects and uh, I think all we'd like to do is to talk about various aspects of a city in the process of uh, urbanization and in the process when engineers actually have uh, contributed to the city's uh, development. In the first lecture, uh, Dr. Shen and Dr. Uh, Tarain enlightened us uh, with uh, the state-of-the-art technology uh, and also the passion uh, of bridge designer and builder. Uh, I would like to tell you a personal story. And uh, the emergency rebuilding of KCR Bridge number 11 in uh, 1976. That's my story or my version of there is no bridge too far. There was this flooding, as we say. In Hong Kong, we rely on rainwater, but it's too much water, it caused flooding. And this Singmoon River was a single track Kowloon Canton Railway on this uh, masonry, three arch, uh, three hole arch bridge. And uh, when uh, somebody is uh, doing excavation without taking care of the foundation, it caused something like this to happen. And in the morning, <coughs> When people went for an inspection of that uh, particular bridge before the train start, they found something like this. We can even see the river from the track. So a decision was quickly taken that there's no way we can repair a masonry bridge of such a damage. So almost instantly, decision was taken to demolish the old bridge and build a new one. And that was in 1976, August. And I was involved as a young engineer, but uh, that's me, right? <laughs> we, are, we are checking a power, power cap, a huge cage with reinforcements, so that after piling, this whole thing can be lift, lifted to, to this, forming the power cap, and then we shop around whatever material we have so that we can start to build the bridge. And the decision was to build it as fast as possible. And we managed to find 
some distressed concrete uh, beam from a neighboring site building a highway bridge. And we found some steel beam, which was uh, uh, kept as a temporary bridge somewhere in government's uh, storage. And uh, that was uh, how we actually go about doing this uh, with the steel components and with the distressed concrete components. People would say this is a very funny way of building a bridge. Half of the bridge is steel, half of the bridge is distressed concrete. But I tell you, after that year, anyone, uh, the team involved in this particular project has gone got a letter from the director, from the then director of public works, which says that the Sartin Bridge provides an essential link in the KCR line, which plays a significant role in the transport system and general economy of Hong Kong. Its successful reconstruction within a short period of six weeks is a highly creditable piece of public works. We finished this project in six weeks, including demolition of the old bridge. So I think engineers have done something. Today, when you go to Taiwai Station and you look back to the bridge, why so silly? Build a bridge with steel and with concrete because we finished it in six weeks. <laughs> we have covered some local cases on how civil engineers protect and transform life. We come to the last part of our presentation when we will talk a little bit uh, of things and experience uh, not in Hong Kong, but overseas. Max and Angel will, will share the, the experience, how we look at the backward areas or in some, some cases uh, when there's a natural disasters, or how we actually uh, recover from the situations. Four years ago, I was given the opportunity to go to Cambodia to bring water and toilets to the students there. As you can see, actually there is everywhere water in Cambodia, especially during flooding in summer. Water is in tank, in river, in lakes, just that it may not be clean. At that time, we met 200 primary school students in a, in a rural school without water, without toilets, especially during flooding. This is so crucial to their health because without the clean water and sanitation, you cannot imagine what kind of water you would drink or how you would go to the toilet. Probably they just go to the same source. And the health is so important to the, these students because it would mean everything for their study, for their lives, and for their future. So with the limited knowledge of five engineering students, we decide an all-weather solution to enable access to toilets and clean water for those students from the two school buildings. The two reinforced concrete platform will endure flooding and provide water well, water, tap, water tank, toilets, and other sanitation facilities for the students when they are at school during flooding. With this solution, we went to Cambodia and find the local workers and materials. As you may imagine, language barrier, cultural gap, and material shortage are all very challenging. But it's our luck that we had the collaboration of 30 Hong Kong volunteers and 10 Cambodian workers to complete the project within five weeks. With the health education program, the students and the villagers are now enjoying the clean water and toilets for their better health. This is a small project, so small that it is incomparable to the Shatin Bridge that CK has built within six weeks, and so small that probably you won't delay on Monday to it. And there is actually great work done by the engineering bodies, government agencies, and NGOs in Cambodia and many other developing countries to help the locals there. But please don't forget, there are still two billions of people in the world without safe access to water or toilets. So there is so much for engineers to done, and they are calling for our essence.
This is a small project that has prepared me and many other engineering students and volunteers to serve better in a greater role to our whole world. Small steps we are taking. Perhaps a week of hard work and sweat may not change much, but it is the motivation behind that is important because these small steps could be the starting point to bring the world together. In the summer before I entered university, I was doing some volunteering work at an organization which collects unwanted goods from Hong Kong people and ship them to some third world countries. One day I received this really old sewing machine and at that time I thought, even if we manage to fix this, no one's going to want it. But my supervisor told me, if we manage to make it to be able to sew straight lines once again, this machine has the ability to save the lives of a family somewhere out there. Don't look down on the smallest efforts we try to make. Living in Hong Kong in this generation, water shortage, severe landslides whenever it rains, flooding in the urban city areas in the summer, difficulty to reach remote parts of the city, seems to be history. But looking at the bigger world, thinking ourselves as global citizens, there are still many places on the other side of the globe that is longing for development and growth. In my training years, I had the opportunities to take on short service trips to a few places, where I observed the state of development and the conditions on ground there were abandoned schools. There were places with no clean and free-flowing water for homes. There was no proper access to many public facilities. And there was no waste education when plastic wrappings start to emerge. Yes, we see them on TV. We read about them on the internet. But maybe they are something more than just a story. Small steps we are taking, but with these joint efforts, maybe we can bring the change. Like simple water supply systems, this was the very first project when we founded the ICE Caring Engineering in 2012, where a little system like this managed to bring clean and reliable water source to 200 families or building public facilities for places where they lack the resources. This was the making of, of a part of the isolation ward of a hospital located in Sierra Leone, western part of Africa, where everything was done manually. Probably concreting a little foundation like this in Hong Kong takes only half a concrete truck, but it took us half a day to do it there. It was literally where every effort and every utilization of available resources counts. Or providing safe shelters in places where living safely was even a concern. This was one of the hospital extensions uh, in Kunduz of Afghanistan, where of course, although locally they do have the skills and resources, the everyday bombing and shelling is not helping. Although I have worked in Africa and Afghanistan for full time for more than a year, it is not the hospitals that I have built for them that I believe has made, had made the biggest change. It is the knowledge that we shared, the vision on development that we post, that brought along long-term change. It is the faith for a better change and the passion for making a little step that drove for longer strides. The world is still in need of international development. The Mediterranean refugee crisis, the wars and internal displacements, the epidemic diseases that still happens in this generation, and the natural disasters. This was why the United Nations came up with the eight Millennium Development Goals in 1999 for 2015, where poverty, gender equality, education, medical and environmental issues were targeted. And in September of 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Summit in the New York City adopted the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, where the MDGs were expanded in, con on, in consideration of more worldwide issues which needs global efforts to manage. 
It was pointed to at the beginning of the lecture that the Global Engineering Congress hosted by the ICE in October had adopted six of the 17 SDGs as the focus of the Congress. Undoubtedly, the UN SDGs and the ICE missions arising from the GEC are the directions for the future, and there will be challenges and fundamental changes, which means bigger steps for us. The world isn't really that far away from us if we think about how we vision for our future generations. We have been through the pre-development and fighting for basic living infrastructure stage. Perhaps we can share experience, our resources, and our vision to the other portions of the world who are still struggling. And while we are on the lucky end, perhaps we can also take lead in striving towards the more sustainable world. Many things may seem unrelated today, but in fact, it is only a matter of time. I think these are very illustrative uh, cases when the engineers can help uh, backward or underdeveloped countries. My personal experience is another uh, illustration of how we can help with uh, uh, disastrous uh, recovery and uh, uh, reconstruction. This is a photo, or this is a plan showing the uh, 12th of May earthquake in Sichuan. In 100 seconds, this is the area actually affected by this uh, devastating uh, earthquake. This uh, big earthquake caused huge damage, and uh, the scale is, uh, uh, cannot be imagined. Look at uh, houses and uh, uh, buildings collapsed. And uh, the statistics that was uh, released uh, soon after the earthquake so that uh, casualty is almost 70,000. And injured people, 374,000. Missing, they may be missing, meaning uh, there is part of the casualty. So all this whole thing come out all of a sudden, and uh, that actually uh, change uh, the life of many families and people. The Hong Kong government uh, took part in uh, the three R's, rescue, relief, and reconstruction. And for engineers in particular, we are in the reconstruction stage. So. A couple of months after the earthquake, when things were settled, people have uh, cover, have water, have uh, food and clothing. Uh, they got warm. We start to move in and discuss with the Sichuan government how to reconstruct uh, the uh, damaged uh, uh, towns and uh, villages. This is a plan showing the scale and uh, uh, location and the scope where we actually carry our work in uh, the uh, earthquake uh, struck areas. At the end of the day, we have uh, ne negotiations and uh, discussions, and it's something that is quite unique in Hong Kong that uh, we contribute nine billion Hong Kong dollars with the Hong Kong Jockey Cup contributing one billion, making a total of 10 billion Hong Kong dollars. And uh, we cannot send construction teams, we cannot send people, we cannot send them a check. So we actually work out a way of project management that we completed something like 56 schools in these uh, particular areas, uh, completed. That was a, just a, a glimpse of uh, what we done. These are the schools of various uh, size, sizes and scale. Some are as big as a mini uh, college with uh, hostels and with uh, uh, sports fields, sports grounds, and 35 hospitals, some with 200 or 300 beds. So it's quite sizable uh, scale. What is uh, really impressive is uh, the rehabilitation centers. Uh, this boy was trapped in the uh, Debbie for many hours. He was uh, actually eventually uh, 
uh, relieved uh, from that, and he lost uh, uh, both legs, uh, one leg. And this girl, in particular, lost uh, one of the, the full, full leg. And uh, with that, the rehabilitation uh, with the project called Stentor was people helping them. And uh, there's something like 35 of these centers uh, built. And the particular place when this earthquake uh, originated, uh, the center, the epicenter, is actually the Panda Conservation, uh, the Panda Home or the Conservation Center, Wallum, where all this uh, earthquake actually uh, started. And uh, in order to help the, the people, there's something like 23 projects, half of which were for Panda, half of which were for the indigenous uh, people, villagers who live in that place, including small schools, small hospitals, clinics, uh, like that. And in particular, in order to go to Wolong, this is Wolong Natural Reserve, 45 kilometers. We have to build a road to go to the, uh, the place if we want to help with the reconstruction. Without the road, we just cannot uh, enter. And this is the kind of uh, terrain. And people have to climb and survey before we can eventually come about doing all this, this work along the river. Looking back on all this, we now finish the work. And this is uh, how it looks like today. It took us uh, very long hours, uh, long days, uh, long, long years actually, when Hong Kong people, uh, civil engineers in particular, uh, taking part in this uh, whole uh, event. This is a statistic of the uh, 151 <coughs> projects. At the end of the day, I think we can safely say that we had helped to transform the life of many people. <clears throat> so we have uh, finished our presentation on projects that could uh, reflect the central theme of ICE 200. Uh, time limitation and because uh, we have various backgrounds, what we have told you just now, what we have presented just now, only provide a very small glimpse of the vast engineering endeavors and achievements over the last uh, 200 years. The ICE has uh, actually put together a book for the bicentenary, this, this book here, Shaping the World, 200 Years of the Institution of Civil Engineer, where an attempt had been made to fund projects that represent the story of civil engineers and civil engineering over the past uh, 200 years. So we like to conclude by referring to uh, uh, this particular event. Uh, and in particular, if you look at this uh, particular book here, civil engineers are the cutting edge of solving the problem our world faces like their predecessors. They harness the inspiration of the best and most creative minds of our journal is given by our patron. Uh, his Royal Highness, the Duke of York, um, in this particular book. So, uh, coming back to UNESCO's uh, 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 Global Engineering Congress, uh, we are uh, happy that that was uh, completed in October and uh, bringing together over 3,500 uh, participants taking part in uh, sharing and exchanging uh, views on, on this. Uh, so the impact engineers have made on the world has been immense. And there are so many projects and, uh, that provide these uh, powerful examples. And uh, the book that I mentioned just now, the book here, already showed that. So uh, we like to finish this uh, presentation uh, this evening uh, by saying that we are really proud uh, to be in the prof profession. And we, we would like to share with you a short statement on the key uh, ingredients, the three priests that we have used as our title. Egyptians built the pyramids with professional skills, and therefore professional skills are not something new. 
In our modern era, apart from the skill set, we shall always strive for technical excellence. And remember that as a problem solver, we have to apply our knowledge with the highest integrity in coming up with solutions. And to communicate with the general public the choices that they can choose from. And always be bold to take up new challenges and trust that we can make a change for the better future. Stay modest in how big we really are to the world, as there is so much more going on outside of our little circle. But at the same time, do not underestimate our capacity for change. With our knowledge, the willingness, and the initiative to take on a little small step, it would perhaps create a small impact that could spread to the people around us, and that it would eventually make the real change. As a graduate engineer in Hong Kong, I feel really fortunate that the engineers in Hong Kong can witness and even take part in some of the mega projects in the world. We can see the whole engineering process from inception to completion, and our infrastructure is envied by many other countries for our reliability and resilience. The World Summit on Sustainable Development called for action. It told us to move from agenda to action. When we pray, move our feet. I firmly believe that with the expertise and profession of every one of you, we can be alert, agile, and prepared to take prompt actions in all our involvements in water, energy, infrastructure, cities, and climate change to fulfill the mission of our profession. 200 years ago, our engineering forefathers found the world's oldest professional engineering institution. Since then, we saw the contribution of the professional engineers transforming the lives of so many people in the world. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should celebrate the past 200 years, inspire the next 200, and help build a sustainable future. In order to do that, we need engineers. We need every, everybody who is interested in engineering to take part. And the past history already demonstrated that the engineering career is creative, rewarding, and it's a lot of fun. Let me end by referring to His Royal Highness the Prince uh, Philip's Jew of Edinburgh. And in an interview, he made this uh, comment. Everything not invented by God is invented by engineers. <laughs> and Winston Churchill said that this is our lovely Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. And I like to quote Winston Churchill, engineer shaped the world. He said, first we shape our building. Thereafter, Thereafter, they shape us, right? Thank you very much. I'll invite uh, Tony to uh, chair a question and answer session. Tony, please. Great. There's a chair. Okay, may I have a chair? chair? Um, thank you very much, CK, Florence, and Joe, and Max. I think, I think it's, a, it's a very inspiring lecture um, in illustrating what engin civil engineers in particular can do and, and have done um, to the communities um, uh, to protect and... Um, yes, please sit down to protect and uh, transform lives. And I think it's a great way to, um, to, to conclude our celebration for um, IC200. Um, I think we can have um, maybe 10 minutes or slightly under 10 minutes, the uh, Q&A session. Any, anyone? Uh, yeah, there's a gentleman in the middle. Can someone pass a, a mic to him?
Um, good evening, speakers. Like it was like a fruitful sharing of all uh, for um, from all of you. Um, I have a little question: Is um, we like civil engineers are experts in building infrastructures, but like we all understand that like how even how great the infrastructure is, like if we don't have like a well developed pol um, policies to work along with it, like things won't get as um, perform as well as what we expected. It's just like um, Hong Kong or even like. Wan Chao will have, gonna have like endless traffic jams unless like some of the traffic flow is going to the western uh, harbor crossings. But sometimes like we engineers find ourselves like irrelevant with those like policies that like, we just like leave those things and back to the pol uh, politicians. And I just want to ask like well, how can like what could we really do like to like we ha we are the experts like in sustainable development like we know how. Um, Things works. Well, how to design um, our policies that best fit with our the infrastructure that we have built? Like, but how can we involve a little bit more on policy making? CK, yes. we like to uh, answer that. I think I think this is a very good question because it it really covers a lot of aspects. Uh, I have the experience of working thirty seven years in uh, the Hong Kong government. Uh, I change from, uh, I move from a professional engineer to an administrative officer. So I can share with you a little bit of my personal experience. Policy is important. Policy is government's uh, subjective way of uh, doing something for the benefits of the people. So in order to plan or formulate a policy, I think it's uh, very important to understand what exactly is the problem. That's number one. Number two, uh, apart from the technical aspect, which should be at your fingertip, if you want to come up with uh, policy, there's policy choices. And uh, my personal experience is that uh, you may compare various choices and study something, and then you put it to the let's go or to the district uh, council or to the politician, Mr. Politician, Mr. District Council, this is best for you. Please support us. I tell you that would die, all right? My golden rule is anyone can come up with fantastic policy and uh, you could think that this is uh, very good. By chance, you come up with a good policy that people could accept. But I would say, no, by choice, not by chance. We should compare various alternatives and show people that you have option A, you have option B, or you even have option C. Each would have an implication, which would, each would have a price tag, which would have uh, far-reaching uh, implications. And let people uh, discuss, let people give their comments, we engage them so that they know what they do. I always think that compromise is, uh, may not be the best uh, outcome. Compromise could be bad compromise, meaning you cannot get what you want, I cannot get what I want. The better way is consensus. How do we build consensus? It's from conflict to consensus. We put things on the table. Let us understand this. We have to trust the public that they can, together, work out solutions. Engineers, it's not just the hardware. Professionalism consists also of the software side, the policy side for everything. At the end of the day, we want to deliver a, a piece of work that can benefit everybody. I hope I understand your question. Thank you, CK. Anyone else? Perhaps I'd like to ask um, a question, a direct question to our um, young engineers here. Uh, Angel and Angel Max. and Max. <laughs> Florence, you are young too, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I, 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 I've the heard um, <laughs> Angel and Max, you, you, you both described uh, what you have done um, um, in, war in um, wandering work to help the underdeveloped communities. Um, so I, I can see that you have a lot of passion 
in doing that. And my question is, in your opinion, um, how could we uh, motivate our young engineers to follow suit your steps? How, how could we um, encourage them um, in, in doing that? And, and in your view, is there anything was lacking or preventing us from doing more? Um, I try. I think Andrew just made a very good point in saying that a small difference can be made for the greater world. <coughs> Sorry. Maybe um, just like maybe our knowledge may be limited when compared to experienced engineers like CK and many others, we can try our best as our profession granted us to see uh, what we can really do to the other parts of the world. Because uh, in Hong Kong, this uh, very great city, that's, as most of the time, probably we will just focus too much on our city, but not outside. The difficult situation in the other part of the world. If we think more, if we get closer to them, probably I think many of us, and we are engineers doing all the engineering work every day. Why not we devote our efforts to the other part of the world? I think we are living in a very lucky generation where a lot of things have been established and built up for us already. Like, should, ha should it have been my parents' generation, even if they have this thought, they might not have the support to be able to do what we can do now. So I think this is the transition time where we start to look more into the world, which I think it actually starts from education from young and also a general atmosphere in this community as well because I don't want to comment too much but I think in general in Hong Kong there the atmosphere for international solidarity is pretty low. Um, so I guess it is the awareness um, that we should bring along to the younger generations first. I mean everyone has different constraints. We're, this is not the best thing that, that, the only best thing that we need to do for the world, but it's one of the choices. So, but at least have this vision, know about what's happening, have a global vision. Florence, Sike, you like to add anything to that? Um, I don't have the chance to, I mean, to go beyond Hong Kong. I mean, to work like um, Angel and Max. But then, um, as I said in the last part on professionalism, um, being an engineer is, um, we're lucky. I think a lot of public, I mean, the general public actually count on us. So why not, I mean, be bold to take up new challenges? Like, I mean, uh, I don't know anything about tree, but then uh, I'm in a new field, and then I'm making a lot of um, uh, friends in the new industry. And then they are actually, um, they respect us a lot. I mean, they, they are willing to learn from us. I think we have built up a very good um, uh, reputation, uh, both in engineering and also, I mean, civil engineering and also geotech engineering. So I think, uh, why not be bold to take up new challenges and trust that, I mean, as, I, as, as we, we said in the last slide, I mean, um, we can, uh, someday we can really make a change, yeah? And I think it's so much in the blood of engineers too, because we like to make things happen. Like this is, this is what we do, we make things happen, we solve problems. So that's the awareness part. We acknowledge the problem, we look into the world, and then we make things happen. CK? Uh, institution of Civil Engineer has 92,000 members, 25% of which are international members, overseas members. And out of that, about 40 to 45 percent are student members. They are really the future of the institution. So I think you should uh, ask Ken, who's the chairman of the Hong Kong A. He's been furiously doing all the projects for our young <laughs> graduates and, and young engineers. And I think that was successful in the, in the last years. And uh, I myself, I would support uh, I like to teach in the university. I, I like to get involved uh, with uh, young engineers, uh, students together, and we can work on projects. I'll tell you a secret. 
teachers never grow old. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can entertain one more question if there's any. Okay. Yeah, yeah Eric. Uh, at one time during the, your presentation, I thought that, oh, Hong Kong, we got construction 2.0, we've got some new ideas like MIC or somewhere else called PPVC, and we can prepare ourselves well to contribute. Uh, somewhere like C2 event, uh, disaster, somewhere in the world, we sh uh, through enterprise, through donation, we get the precast salmon to that country immediately or fast, uh, promptly. But uh, after the sharing by Andrew, I'm inspired, I got another angle now. Education seems more important. We have to educate them uh, to um, build up themselves in their own country. So I would like to ask if uh, ICE Hong Kong or ICE UK, do we kind of like uh, support NGO or what are we going to do to provide our professionalism to those who are developing or some country that need our uh, engineers. Could I, could I handle that? I see uh, really have an eye in the international arena. There's the ICE learning hub when uh, members, student members in particular, would have free access to a lot of information, a lot of reference. So uh, student members uh, need not pay a fee. They are they just enjoy uh, all the information provided, all the resources provided by ICE. So uh, you are right, and we support this uh, idea of education, training, and how we can mentor, how we can take young engineers, and in particular, to let them know that this is, uh, as we say, a rewarding and creative career. And there's a lot of fun. Like last year, we have this, uh, Lego bridge building, we have these uh, toy games and all this. I think these are all a means to help the people, to the young people, to get uh, interested in the engineering career. Like this option? Anyone? Um, I had helped in the graduates and students committee for quite some time last year, and there are some GNS committee and members here as well. Uh, I believe. What we did last year, like we have brought our members to some social services, to some uh, social experience. And what we want the most is uh, how our graduates and students tell us what they want to do, instead of we bring them the activities. Because this would be the best way to know how their profession or what the training they want the most to equip themselves with the everyone challenge, how they can best serve the global communities. So I believe uh, if you have any ideas, just talk to Vincent, our chairman of GNS this year. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, CK, Florence, Angel, and Max. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Over to you, uh, Johnny. Thank you, Tony, and thank you all the speakers. Um, I'd like to now invite Ken to present some souvenirs to our speakers. Ken, please. First of all, we have um, Professor C.K. Mack. Thank you. And we have uh, Lawrence next. We also have uh, Angel. And Max. Last but not least, Tony, our chairman of the ICE Distinguished Lectures.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. I would, I would like to now invite Ken to propose a vote of thanks. Ken, please. Okay, um, fellow ICE members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the ICE Hong Kong Association, I would like to thank CK, Florence, Angel and Max for delivering a fa fascinating lecture, which was full of tacit knowledge, insights and inspirations. I wish to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our guest of honor, Professor Ian Holliday, for gracing this occasion and his kind address. I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to Tung Lee, who has been our mastermind for this distinguished lecture series, and to the organizing team comprising Ivy, Johnny, David, and many other, many other helpers, together with the ICE Hong Kong Regional Office, our angels Jenny, Christo, and Jessica, who have all worked tirelessly to ensure the smooth running of this event. Our distinguished speakers tonight have reminded us of the passion, spirit, and mission of civil engineers in protecting and transforming lives. This is a timely reminder as we are facing an image crisis in Hong Kong, whereby our professional reputation is at stake due to various construction-related malpractices and scandals. These have collectively dented the image of the industry in terms of professionalism, competence, and integrity, which are, of course, our core values. I think the world has moved on and we cannot afford to continue to live on our past. We need to transform our profession and embrace more innovations and game-changing ideas. We need to re-energize the practitioners. We need to rebrand our image and rebuild public confidence. Tonight's lecture is a finale of our bicentenary program in Hong Kong. I would like to take this opportunity to reflect on this. Over the course of this year, we have successfully implemented the bicentenary program with many showpiece events. Apart from the distinguished lecture series, other signature events included the Civil Engineering Board Game Design Competition, the Innovation Summit, the Masterclass for Tomorrow's Global Leaders targeting secondary, secondary school students, public exhibition of the Guinness World Record Lego Suspension Bridge, the Shaping Our Future City campaign, and a dedicated series of technical seminars themed recent advances in civil engineering. We had a vision for our bicentenary program comprising four goals. Firstly, to showcase ICE's thought leadership and excellence. Secondly, to advance professional knowledge and competence. Thirdly, to enthuse ICE members and practitioners. And lastly, to inspire the, new, the next generation. I hope you will agree that the above goals have been largely accomplished through our innovative and exciting ICE 200 program. The distinguished lecture tonight is a classic in that it has hit on all, four, all the four goals in an outstanding manner. All in all, 2018 has been a remarkable and rewarding year for ICE HAA and our members. Thank you very much and I look forward to your continued support. Thank you very much, Ken, for your uh, closing remark and uh, particularly your kind words to me. Um, Johnny, I understand that uh, at first we have some announcement, is that yeah, right? I am going to um, advertise uh, a number of upcoming IC events. Uh, as far as I remember, the first one is a signature event, our annual conference 2019. Um, this is going to be held on the 26th of um, April, if my memory serves me well. 
and the title is Reducing the Risk of Infrastructure. There you go. The role of technology, innovation, and governance. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, check out the details from our website or our Facebook page. Apart from that, we also have a networking event tomorrow. Um, we're going to have uh, Christmas strings in, uh, in Central, uh, Tycoon, Tycoon. So if you want to enjoy some drinks to celebrate the Christmas, which is only a few days away, please come around to um, chat around to, uh, with our friends. Apart from these two, we actually have a long list of upcoming events. I won't be going through these one by one, otherwise I have to go on for another hour. So I'll just leave the slide here. Uh, as I say, uh, check out our website or our Facebook page. And uh, that's all from me, Tony. Okay, I'm glad and greatly relieved now that all three uh, matches are now done. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm really very honored um, to participate and contribute to the ICE 200 um, celebration as a chair of the Distinguished Natures. Um, and I'd like to thank um, all the speakers um, this evening and in the previous two um, Natures, um, our co-organizers, Hong Kong U tonight, uh, sponsors and supporting organizations, my ex-colleagues at AECOM and in particular Ivy and, um, and Johnny, um, the staff of the IC Hong Kong A um, office, Eva, um, Jenny, Crystal, and others, uh, Ken, for your guidance throughout. Um, last but not least, every one of you, without your support, um, the matches uh, would not have been as successful. So um, I wish you all um, Merry Christmas and uh, happy and prosperous New Year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you next time.